Welcome from around Australia. My name is Don Tyson James. We're taking you through the idea of working from pretty much anywhere you like and building a life around mobile work. I'm not talking about scams, schemes, or ways to make money that are going to involve Bitcoin or anything like that. This is all about the reality of doing it, the tools you're going to require to do it, and all those things that are going to make it just that little bit easier to be able to achieve whatever that dream is of yours to be able to work from pretty much everywhere. While my background is currently saying that I'm in Darwin, the reality is if I turn this off, you'll see that I'm actually in a spare room at my parents' place right now. So I just gotta turn that off. Um, yeah, I'm in the spare room at their place. Just got some really good light, a fan going above me because I'm literally living this life right now. Um, so let's pretend for a moment that I might be in San Francisco, okay? Let's go to San Francisco at the moment and see if I can pretend that I'm in a, a glamorous part of the world apart from in uh, maybe Ormo Hills in the, in the suburbs of Brisbane and the Gold Coast. Didn't get a lot of great sleep last night because I was sleeping on an unfamiliar bed, not here at, at a hotel and had very early meetings to do this morning. So that's the uh, some of the reality of what happens in this particular kind of life. But if you're looking for some tips about how to really do this well and be able to carry it out in the kind of work you can do, well, you've definitely come to the right place. Let's share that screen and let's get it all started and underway. We're talking all about working from anywhere and the logistics an insight about being a digital nomad and what it really takes and how to do it and um, how it's going for me in particular because um, sometimes I wake up some mornings and go, I just want a normal life again. And then other times I go, you know what? This is just the life I couldn't imagine living any other way. A quote from James Missioner, if you reject the food, ignore the customs, fear the religion and avoid the people, you might better stay at home. That's something I've certainly learned as someone who's been making my way across, you know, three countries now um, working. And it's something that um, has made me realize that as you move around, in particular Australia, I do most of my stuff within Australia. It's not like I'm, I'm one of those uh, Bali-based um, digital nomads who's sitting in Changu and um, sipping on, on cocktails all day by the pool with a laptop on my lap. Um, it's very much an Australian thing. So as you learn it, you've got to learn a little bit about the places where you're going to be if you're going to spend time in them. And what the advantage has been that I've now have friends from all sorts of different backgrounds and right across Australia because I've taken the time to invest in those friendships and come to those places quite regularly. So what we're going to look at today is what the digital nomad actually is the kind of work that you can do, the tools of your trade. And by goodness, there are a lot of them and I'm only going to cover a few of them, but there are a lot of tools of the trade. We're going to look at how you find clients and also getting used to the art of compromise because there's going to be a fair bit of compromise when it comes to that whole living remote, working remote thing. Now, there's lots of different versions of living and working remote. So we're going to cover as many of those as I can as I've lived a few of those myself. This is brought to you by Business Station and the Australian Small Business Advisory Services Digital Solutions Program. It's an Australian government initiative in, consult, in conjunction with, sorry, Business Station in WA, Regional Development Australia, Brisbane in Queensland, and Treaty Business Consulting in the Northern Territory, which is where I'm normally based. This will be available a little bit later on on YouTube through the Business Station channel. I also have it on my business channel as well. And it's going to be making like a, a very big difference in the way that I think that you can view this later because there's going to be tips and tricks you're going to want to come back to again and again. I actually wish I could show it to you. I might be able to do it for you now, but um, show you that, like, for instance, there's a lot of background noise going on where I am right now, but I'm using a particular piece of software that's allowing me to get around with that. So if I just say, um, here's my regular MacBook Pro microphone. Now, what you're going to hear is the background noise of someone mowing the lawn out the front, a dog yapping in the background, someone in the kitchen clanging on things around. Um, I'm not in a very sound, calm environment, but I'm using a particular plugin that allows me to, and I change over. And we change back to here, it removes all the background noise. So it focuses in just on my voice. This is one of those very important tools that you might find very useful in your toolkit. It's called Crisp, K-R-I-S-P. If you look for that, Crisp sound you'll be able to find that and it's a very cheap plugin for your computer that allows you to run your microphone through this software the ai in the software removes all the background noise and it's a great piece of software i don't make anything out of this it's just made a massive difference in my ability to be able to work from pretty much anywhere 
I thought I'd just share that example because it came up right at that point. Now, my education is a lot more traditional than what it is. Normal schools, normal universities, all that sort of thing. Um, I've done some non-traditional stuff through TAFE and the Chartered Institute of Marketing as well. And I've done a lot of certifications with Facebook Australia, who um, part of their problem in the last year was they couldn't travel anywhere. Global lockdowns, um, all the work I'd normally do with them across Australia, couldn't do in this particular setup because of COVID-19, right? So I've then used that, that time to do the maximum amount of certifications I properly can. So there's the Facebook Blueprint Lead Trainer, which is a global qualification, which I'm the only holder of in Australia. And then we've got the qualification as a community trainer within Australia. I've got that one. I'm a digital marketing associate media planning professional with them as well as working with the Google Digital Springboard Project and a couple of government programs as well through the Australian Small Business Advisory Services Digital Solutions Program, Be Connected, which is helping older Australians remain online, and the new business assistance through the new enterprise incentive scheme through the Australian government as well. So enough about me. Let's get on with what the digital nomad actually is. I feel like I might change my little background there because um, San Francisco just does not feel realistic for me right now. So let's uh, put us back in, uh, what have I got? Let's, let's be really digital nomad here and sit on the beach right now. That seems to work for me. On the beach, some tropical paradise that's not Darwin where I normally am because it doesn't look quite that good. We don't have waves in Darwin. Let's just say I'm in, you know, the Whit Sundays somewhere or maybe in the South Pacific. It feels like a great way to be. <laughs> I don't know if I'm very convincing. The digital nomad typically looks like this. This is what we imagine the digital nomad to look like. Young people working at their laptops on MacBook Pros usually in Bali, overlooking rice paddies and beautiful views and beaches and sipping on lattes and, and cheap food and drink um, by living the dream in another country and doing Zoom calls like this young lady is doing in the front. Now, whilst that is a reality for a lot of people, most digital nomads don't leave the country. Most of us are just working within Australia from different places. So right now I'm in Brisbane. So this morning I was working from um, a, a hotel in Milton in Brisbane. This afternoon, I'm working from my parents' place in Ormo in the Gold Coast. Then in the next few days, I'm going to complete, I'm going to be going to Tambourine. I'm going to be doing a couple of webinars and workshops um, online from Mount Tambourine. And then next week on Wednesday, I go to Cairns. So I could say that I could wear the same shirt, do the same stuff, have similar lighting and have a background on and pretend I'm going to be anywhere in the world. But I like to embrace that whole idea that I do move around a lot. I go across a lot of different states this year. I'm going to be covering five states and I'm going to be away about 50% of the time. So the digital nomad has to be someone who's willing to get away from the house occasionally and lose a few of those creature comforts. Um, the one thing I do take with me all the time is my favorite pillow. I don't care what else I have to throw out of my luggage, that pillow comes with me. Digital nomads are essentially people who use telco technologies to earn a living and conduct their life in something of a nomadic manner. Now, mine's not quite that full nomad. I'm not pitching a tent everywhere I go. I've got a home. I've got an apartment that I pay a lot of money for in Darwin, and I'm, I'm there a good 50% of the time. But when I'm on the road, I've got to learn that I don't have all my screens, I don't have all my stuff, but I've got the basics with me. Such workers often work remotely from foreign countries. Yep, interstate as well, I'd add there, and other cities. Coffee shops, that is absolutely true. I've worked in more coffee shops than anything else. Public libraries when you can find them because they're nice and quiet. And co-working spaces when they're not too expensive to go to. There's a great one just around the corner from where I'm staying right now, which is really nice way, but they force you to do a membership. Or it could be recreational vehicles, caravans, the car. I've done, um, I did a very quick webinar oh, about three weeks ago in Alice Springs from Anzac Hill in the car. I propped up the laptop on the steering wheel and had to do my webinar from there because I couldn't find anywhere locally that I could go and do some work from. So I had to do the very best with what I had at the time. How COVID-19 has changed digital nomads, though, is it's swung around everything from being about those who are setting up shop and living um, remotely overseas in places like Bali, Thailand, the Philippines, um, maybe East Timor, Papua New Guinea, Fiji, Vanuatu. There's a lot of people in Vanuatu who are Aussies who are working remotely for Australian businesses. Um, so this year, it was oh, this past year has all been about people moving to regional areas that were relatively normal, safe and calm away from the, the hot spots of COVID activity. So cities like Cairns did really well. Mission Beach, 
places like Margaret River, going to further afield outside of Perth to places like Geraldton or even up to Broome. Darwin had a massive influx of people coming, what we call COVID refugees, coming up to take advantage of relatively cheap real estate, which is no longer cheap because they bought it all. And um, also places where they could go to nightclubs, go to pubs, have a relatively normal life, whilst the place they were from, Sydney and Melbourne, were in relative states of lockdown, couldn't go to restaurants couldn't go to nightclubs couldn't go they couldn't do anything and also tasmania and cairns both really did well out of this tassie having a bit of a real estate boom as well as people moved to a place that they saw as maybe safer to work remotely now this is not a digital nomad this is more of a digital refugee of sorts somebody who's going to another place in australia to have an idea of where to live based upon having a bit more comfort in their lives away from the perceived dangers of COVID-19 in their main cities. So yes, the, 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 the digital nomad who was going to Bali and Thailand, the Philippines is no longer doing that. Just for now, we do expect that return. But just yesterday, I was on a webinar, uh, sorry, on a um, Zoom call with someone who is actually um, a digital nomad in Bali. And she lives in lots of different villas around Bali and lives a very lean life and loves it over there because it's so cheap. And it's actually cheaper for her to go from luxurious villa to luxurious villa all around Bali than what it is for her to pay for rent in her hometown in Sydney. So you've got the different kind of digital nomads. What we'll have a look at is the kind of things, I guess, that they do. What are the kind of work that a digital nomad does? And some ideas in here for you for the kind of work that you may want to do as a digital nomad. And feel free to drop in if you've got some ideas. I'd love to have a discussion with you about that. Might even bring you up to the microphone to have a chat about if you've got a particular idea you'd like to try as a digital nomad yourself. So digital skills are obviously in very big demand when it comes to digital nomads. Programmers, coders, um, developers, people working with software packages, web designers, uh, social media managers, all those obvious ones that we're probably thinking of. Yeah, that's what digital nomads are, the digital skills. Graphic designers, course creators are really big right now. And digital content creators, people making video and audio and all that sort of stuff that comes with creating the stuff that goes on social media, not just for ourselves, but for our clients as well. They're the obvious things, I think, that come with digital skills. And there's a lot of demand for all of these things. Things. They're all very popular, but the other skills could be things like bookkeepers and accountants who don't necessarily need to be in one place unless their business is built upon very personal touch and people sitting down having a cup of coffee or a beer with them over that sort of stuff. People who are business advisors, people who can provide business advice or business growth advice remotely don't have to be in the place where they live and they may not be even serving people anywhere near the place where they live. Trainers and facilitators have become well, what I'm doing right now. I'm doing this from a spare bedroom in my parents' place at a desk and on a chair and drinking a coffee. It's um, not the best coffee in the world, but it's what I've got. Really, really, <laughs> They don't drink coffee. So I had to buy some Macona from the supermarket on the way here. Trainers and facilitators particularly have really taken off in this time. If you've got a very clear way of communicating, if you've got a very good personality that comes across on video calls really well, and you can be quite engaging with what you're doing, then a trainer or a facilitator can really do well out of the whole digital nomadic lifestyle. Life coaches, that's, I guess, one that's sort of come up in the last few years. A lot of life coaches, and I refer to someone I know, Liesl and Brendan, they're a couple who live in Bali. Bali comes up a lot with digital nomads. You'll probably notice it's cheaper, it's close to Australia. A lot of people speaking English over there, and it's just a beautiful place to be. Lots of beaches, lots of cheap bintang. So you see the life coaches and a lot of um, lifestyle coaches, NLP coaches, those kind of people who can do things over a Zoom call like we're doing now. They are the, also the kind of people who do well as a nomadic lifestyle. So if they want to park themselves in, and, and I've got to qualify this, the nomadic lifestyle isn't literally pitching a tent, taking a tent with you or hopping in a caravan necessarily, even though it can involve that. You can do it. A guy I work with, Tim Davies, he lives in a caravan and travels Australia with his kids and his wife, and they have an amazing life. They packed up everything in Melbourne and decided they were going to, just before COVID, mind you, go on this trip around Australia. So they've managed to sort of 
hop borders when they could, park in places where they could. They've had this amazing year of bonding as a family and traveling as a family because Tim is a digital guy, digital marketing, marketing traditional sense and a web developer as well. So he can do a lot of work from his caravan. So whenever we catch up with him on a Zoom call, it's always like, where's Tim today? Where are you guys parked today? Oh, you're in northern New South Wales. Oh, you're in Geelong or you're in, in South Australia. It was always really fun to see the different places he would end up at. Um, instructors, people who are instructing things like even yoga, yoga instructors, dance instructors, voice instructors, people who teach people how to speak, people who teach people how to use things like Zoom. Those kind of people are doing excellent at digital, digital nomads as well. And school tutoring is one of those things that's really come across, particularly in the, in the age of COVID, where there's not really much that needs to be done in person, except if the child who is needing tutoring really needs that, 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 that person right next to them. Now, given that our kids these days are digital natives, which means that they've never known a world without the internet and never known a world without these mobile phone things that's showing up on my screen. No, it's not. That's the background killing my mobile phone on me. Um, if you're not, um, yeah, if, if you've got kids who have never known a world without this, this is how they communicate. This is how they experience the world first is they do it through digital means. Doing things through you know, stuff like this makes a, it doesn't, it doesn't bother them. They don't need that necessarily that personal touch of someone standing in front of them, waving their, wagging their finger at them, telling you what they're doing wrong. This is native for them. It's just a little bit weird for those of us who are of a certain vintage that didn't grow up this way. So now we know the kind of things you could do. Let's take a quick look at what is actually in demand when it comes to digital natives and digital nomads and the kind of work you can do. The stuff that's in very high demand right now is the same thing that's in high demand for outsourcing to the Philippines, really. Digital marketers, people who understand Facebook ads platform, Google ads, SEO, all those sort of marketing things, including copywriting, these things are really in demand and particularly for people who are willing to work for a little less because their lifestyle costs them a lot less. Um, if they're going to places like regional centers where the cost of living is a lot lower or if they're in Bali, for instance, I'll bring it up again, or the Philippines and they happen to be an Aussie who's over there and they've got a clear speaking voice. They, uh, English is their first language and they don't have any sort of cultural gaps. They completely understand what you're saying. Those people are in very high demand right now. Web designers have not really seen any sort of you know, dip in demand in the last 20 years, to be honest. Web designers are still something which is very much in demand, especially those who are quite reasonably priced. Computers are definitely in demand right now. We're look, they're looking for people who are able to um, do, I guess, teaching in such a way that makes sense online, particularly those, again, who have that clear speaking Aussie voice and that cultural reference. And then they get, understand completely who it is they're talking to, the language they're speaking and making the right kind of cultural references as well. Coders and programmers are probably some of the most in-demand skills across this planet right now. If it's one thing you can always be sure of, if you know how to program, you know how to code, you know how to be a software developer, you're never going to be out of work because it's one of those things where, even though I believe it's the first thing that AI will kill, at the moment, AI is not able to do this itself. So you're going to be in big demand. Project managers is an interesting one. You wouldn't think the project managers will be something that was hugely in demand, especially from remote workers, but project managers, people who can bring together a team, motivate them and keep them going and run a project from start to finish, don't necessarily have to be in person unless it's like a construction project, for instance. If it was a construction project. You have to be on the ground to see that work actually going and you have to see people and negotiate with people probably a little bit different. But if you're doing a project such as an online project, if you're doing an arts project, if you're organizing meetings, if you're organizing business change, that kind of thing, that doesn't require you to be in any one particular place. So as a project manager, you've got a pretty good idea. If you know how to use the techniques, if you know the project management methodologies, you're in a good place for that digital nomad lifestyle. Digital trainers like myself, obviously in a lot of demand, I get a lot of work and I'm not seeing that work um, abate at all at the moment. And even when this particular program I'm on ends, there's still a lot of work I've got to do for other programs, including all my own online courses. And then digital advisors, people who know what they're doing with particular platforms, have got the experience of working with them and have certifications that prove they know what they're doing. 
those people have a lot of work coming their way. I've got a full roster this week of ASBAS Digital Solutions calls. So I've got no slowness at all when it comes to the work that's coming in, even though I'm not physically in Darwin much at all this month. In fact, most of the month, I'm not in my hometown. I'm away doing other things in other places. This week, Brisbane. Next week, Cairns. In two weeks' time, I'll be in Broome. So you've got to get that idea that you know you can still carry on the work as long as you choose work that can sort of carry itself. And there's, and I'm going to do a few pitfalls and pros and cons a little bit later because there are things that do go wrong. Like, for instance, I'm sitting here. I've got a client calling me right now, and I know exactly what they're calling me for because I was supposed to call them an hour ago, and I forgot that I double booked. So there are a few little organizational things you'll have to look at and we'll sort of take a bit more of a look at those, you know, pros and pitfalls towards the end of this presentation. So what worries clients? Ironically, I'm going to talk about one of the things I did myself this morning is something that concerns a client, right? It's the holiday attitude. Now, that's not the one I'm referring to that I did this morning. It's the holiday attitude of like, oh, I'm on holidays, palm trees swinging in the breeze over here, then the waves in the background. It's a nice place to be sipping on my pina colada on the beach in Bali or my coffee in a piglet mug. It's the idea that you can get very relaxed and very lax in your attitudes and, and not particularly professional and not particularly helpful and available when you need to be. That can worry clients a little bit. Starting locally, so if they've met you locally, now this happened with a um, someone who I lost a contract to in Darwin about two years ago. So we're both pitching for the work. She got the work, she was starting local. So they just got on really well with her. They understood her, she had a really good pitch and it was a great pitch. She deserved to win it and it was another local, good on her. She won that. And then a month after she won it, she moved to Bali. Again, Bali. What, what is it with Bali? So she moved to Bali and then didn't tell them. She just uh, developed this whole thing of, oh, well, I started locally, took a bunch of photos. And now I've got someone in town who takes the photos for me. Um, yeah, I'm running all this from Bali. See ya. Obviously, the client was not particularly pleased with that because they weren't advised that this was part of the deal. They were just advised that, oh, okay, she's going to leave. She's going to get up and go. And then that was the end of it. Um, they didn't have a good experience. They didn't enjoy that experience. And in the end, end up sacking her. Now, they didn't come and take me on. They just thought, well, all these digital people are all a bunch of rip-off artists. And because of her behavior, she ended up causing problems for those of us who also do what she does. Big time zone differences can really affect your clients. So by big time zone differences, I'm talking about, you know, your client is in Perth and you're currently in North America, where there's a massive time zone difference day and night. It doesn't match up. Your working hours and their working hours are very, very different. Then you've got a problem. You're going to have clashes, right? Unanswered emails and unanswered phone calls or unreturned phone calls and unreplied to emails, probably a more correct way of looking at it. They can be a real yellow flag that tells a client that, wait, this whole working remotely thing that you're trying to pull here isn't really working as well as it possibly could be. One of the worst things, and it happens a lot more with international um, digital nomads than what it is for people like myself who work uh, within Australia just about all the time, is that disappearing without notice. So they suddenly just go on, okay, I'm over in Bali, made a bit of money. I'm going to disappear for three months and go scuba diving in the Solomon Islands. That kind of stuff, it happens all the time with digital nomads. They start off doing this work, they love doing the work, and then they get this offer to go on this once in a lifetime diving adventure with sunfish, the, the, um, the mola mola fish in the Solomon Islands. And they're like, yep, see ya, I'm totally going to do that. I'm not missing out on that. That's what I did this nomadic life for, is to live and you know, suck the very juices out of life itself. You gotta still understand that remote work is still work. And this is something I have a lot of trouble trying to convince people of, and certainly my family who I'm here with right now, is that remote work is still work. Work from home is still work. You still have to deliver stuff, right? Which brings me then to the dropping of projects midway through, disappearing without notice, and then dropping projects midway through because you got something better paying or you've got something more important or you just lost interest in it. That holiday attitude can often get really, really infected into your work ethic to the point where you just go, oh, what are they going to do? I'm in another country. What are they going to do? Sue me? Come get me. I'm in Bali. 
you know, that kind of attitude really is a red flag to a client because that's exactly what they were scared of with dealing with someone who works remotely or someone who's outsourced offshore is they have no comeback, no recompense when it comes to problems appearing with projects, problems appearing with the arrangements they've had with that person. Sudden outsourcing. This again is a really big red flag that you go and you do that, that, that lifestyle where you want to go and hop in a caravan and go all around the country. And it's an amazing thing to be able to do. But if you then go, well, I, I don't take your photos and video anymore. Um, Shelly, who lives back in, in, in Brisbane, she now does that for you. So she's going to be the one who's going to drop in and do that for you. Oh, okay. Um, why won't you be here? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm traveling around Australia in a caravan for the next six months. See ya. That sudden outsourcing where it was never mentioned before, particularly really early into the relationship with a new client, it's just not really, it's not really the way to do it. You've got to be very honest with this. If you're looking to live that lifestyle and you have to be honest with people, you're living that lifestyle. I have to let my clients know that half the time this year, I'm not going to be in Darwin. So to expect that there's going to be some scheduling issues when it comes to seeing me in person. I love seeing my clients in person. I also love seeing my family. My mom and dad are getting older now. I want to spend more time around them. I want to be more connected to my brother. So I've got to spend a bit more time on the road in Brisbane and the Gold Coast seeing them. But I also want to expand my markets outside of Darwin and do a lot more work in places like Broome in Adelaide, Tasmania, Northern New South Wales and North Queensland as well. So it means I've got to go to those places and do some work. People, they can't understand. This is a particularly concerning thing. And it's not from a root of racism. It's from a root of, I'm a client. I want to be understood. I want to know that you understand what I want so that when I get the thing I paid for, it actually is the thing that I thought I was paying for. Now, this falls apart with outsourced arrangements, particularly with dealing with outsourced teams in the Philippines and India and Vietnam, which are three of the greatest places to do outsourcing work with. Now, whilst you're not necessarily outsourcing, um, one of the fears they have is that you're going to go overseas and then they're going to be handed off to your local assistant who is in wherever you happen to be. Let's just say Thailand. Your local assistant is Thai, speaks English, but doesn't have the same colloquialisms, the same relationship, the same empathy, and the same language skills and cultural references that you do as the Australian who's traveling. So this is a problem where people go, well, once you get over there, you're going to get this assistant. They're going to be from the country. I'm not going to be able to understand them. They're not going to be able to understand me. It sounds like it's all too much to deal with. I'll just go with the local guy. Thanks. And that's when you may have to go, well, that is an actual distinct possibility. This could happen. Just be honest about it and say, well, yeah, this actually could happen. This could be a problem that comes up. Let's see what we can do about that. What doesn't worry your clients too much at all, the stuff that really they don't concern themselves with too much is things like patchy internet connections. Oops, go back one screen, sorry. Or mistakes on screen is probably one thing they probably shouldn't concern themselves too much with. But patchy internet connections, they kind of expect it. It's going to be a Zoom call. You're going to have a bit of back and forward. You know, Zoom calls are kind of a little bit like seances. You know, Ooh, are you there? Can you hear us? Come on, say your name, say your name so we know who you are. It's, it's, it can be a very, very dire experience. So patchy internet connections, we're used to, we're in Australia, we're used to patchy internet, even if we've got an MBN. So I'm connecting through my mobile phone right now because I think that the internet connection that I've got here at my parents' place may not be quite as reliable as my Vodafone or Telstra connections on my phone. Mind you, these patchy internet connections for me is phone number, I can't even see it, phone number one, uh, phone number two, which is the iPhone, both on Telstra. This one's my Vodafone one that does most of my stuff. And this one is one of my government programs that I work on, which is phone number four. In combination, I have something like 700 gigabytes of data that I can use. And that is a bit of a tool of your trade, which will come across very shortly. Zoom calls don't worry clients too much. They don't feel too bad about them. Um, they've gotten used to them this past year, especially with webinars. I remember the beginning of this ASBAS digital solutions platform that we couldn't seem to get anybody on a webinar. Now, that's the primary way that people want to connect with us rather than live in-person workshops because they don't have to take huge chunks out of their day. They can do this while they're cooking, while they're cleaning, while they're doing anything they want, put it on their phone and they're watching and enjoying it all. Casual dress doesn't particularly bother them. I'm just wearing a polo shirt here at the moment. I don't have to wear a suit and tie. But the, the girl I was speaking to yesterday who is an Australian, 
basing herself in Bali, she dressed up in office wear that she would wear if she was in Sydney. She's from Sydney, now living in Bali, working remotely, and she dresses up for every meeting like she's having a meeting in Sydney. That's the way she wants to conduct her business. But she'd probably find that she doesn't actually have to do that because the clients she works with are quite happy to work with her on a very casual basis. Over-communication does not bother your client. Trust me, more communication is better than less communication. Your client wants to hear what's going on. Your client wants to know that things are going to be okay. Your client absolutely, positively wants to know what's going on with their project. That's what they're paying you for. And half of that is not just getting the project done, but letting them know where the project is. This was a lesson I learned very difficultly when it came to that over-communication. I'm not an over-communicator. It's not something I do. I don't like phone calls, but clients need to know where things are at. So they don't necessarily want to be put into an online portal, which tells them they want you to call them and explain to it or have a call with them that says, this is where I'm at with doing that work for you. Taking days off with, with notice is not such a bad thing. It's when it has no notice that things are bad. If you take days off and disappear for a couple of days and don't answer emails, they go, where is he? He's abandoned me. Oh, that's not so great. Taking some days off when you tell people, say, hey, I'm taking a couple of days off next week. You, you won't be able to get hold of me on Tuesday and Wednesday, but we'll be back Thursday. And if there's anything absolutely urgent, I'll be available on the phone. You can call me. They don't really care about where you are in the world as long as it doesn't impact their calls, impact the quality of what you're doing and impact the time zone because slight time zone difference, not a problem. It's one of the reasons why the Philippines and Indonesia are very popular places for Australians to do remote work from because they've got pretty much Western standard time, the Perth time. So it's very, very similar to Australian time. And if if it's even if you're on the East Coast of Australia, the difference is only two hours. So you can sort of work it around very, very similar work hours or do what I do when I'm in Bali and I'm working from there very rarely, like I've done it maybe twice. Um, when I'm doing that, I just start two hours earlier in the day. So I'm syncing my time with the majority of where my clients are on that particular day. And I don't really mind international phone calls. Um, most international phone calls are included now with most packages on mobile phones in Australia anyway. And the other thing is to you calling back often like for instance, Vodafone, if I'm in another country, um, it costs me about $5 a day on top of my um, regular package to be able to just make regular phone calls using the local network. And it even allows me to use my data allowance that I've got within Australia. So it's not a hard thing to do, just making sure you've got the right kind of package with your provider. The tools of your trade as the digital nomad are going to be many and varied. I sort of previewed one a little bit earlier on, which is CRISP, K-R-I-S-P, which removes all the background noise from my microphone. So I talk into my microphone, which this little guy here, if it shows up, you see him? Oh, he's dropped out there. This guy, the Rode um, USB mini mic. Um, what it does, it takes all the noises coming through, focuses in on my voice and removes all the stuff in the background. So dad just walked through the front door, drove into the driveway, made a bit of noise. Mum and dad are talking in the kitchen right now. Um, there's a fan going in overhead. There's a dog barking in the background and there's a big lawnmower on the easement outside, like a big tractor going around and cutting the lawn. And you won't hear any of that. That's all cut out because it's one of the tools of my trade is to make it as clear and easy to communicate with me, even if I've got other things going on around me. So the most obvious tools of the trade, the laptop computer. Now, one thing I'll tell you about a laptop computer is do not skimp on your laptop. If you're gonna go digital nomad, you need to have a good solid laptop computer. I use Apple Macintosh ones because they just work for me. I've never had a problem with one. I've never had one break down. I've never had one go to anything less than it's meant to do. But I've also made sure I've got a backup. So I've got an Apple Mac. I've got my backup old Apple Mac that I use. And I've also got a Windows computer. So if all comes to the end, wherever I go, I carry these three little laptops with me in the one bag. So if one fails, the next one kicks in. If that one fails, the next one kicks in. I might be unlucky to have one fail. I'd be very, very unlucky to have two or three fail. So having those backups makes it feel great and gives me extra screens as well. It means I can monitor things over here, monitor things over there if I really want to. Today, I'm just working from this one screen. And I'm able to operate just fine. Your phones are gonna be your lifeline. So whether you're working in Indonesia or working in South Australia, it doesn't matter. As long as you've got a good mobile phone that's reliable 
and it's connected to a mobile network that gives you lots and lots of data allowance because that data allowance is going to be how you're going to be communicating a lot of the time when you're not in co-working spaces or if you're not in a you know, free wi-fi area or you're not in a cafe or something like that which gives you that free wi-fi so if you're using your mobile data you need a lot of mobile data now I get a fair chunk. I've got a shared plan with one of my government projects and pro, uh, one of my government um, contracts that I use quite a lot of, um, but I can't always do that because I'm not always working for them. When I'm working for myself, I may use one of my Telstra phones and so my iPhone, or I might use my Vodafone one, which has something like 400 gigabytes of, I've got tons and tons of, of gigabytes available. And yes, I'm paying a lot for all that, but that's the price of making sure you've got reliable internet wherever you go. I can't just have my Vodafone one, despite it having the most generous data allowance, because Vodafone doesn't connect everywhere I go. Earlier in, in uh, the second week of February, I was in a place called Nulamboy, which is in the west, uh, the East Arnhem Land region of the Northern Territory. Now they have fairly good mobile connectivity there, but only if you were Telstra, <laughs> you can't get with any of the others. I was in Tennant Creek, for instance, which is um, the, the, the main town that you turn, you know, as you're driving down from Darwin, you turn left and you head towards Queensland. Um, can't get Vodafone there, just Telstra and Optus. So I couldn't use my main one, so I've got to have a backup. So you could go straight to the source and go, well, just go with Telstra because they're available anywhere. The problem is, though, when I was on Fitzroy Island in Cairns, uh, when was that? Over... I don't even remember when it was, maybe November. Um, when I was there last, I couldn't get a signal with Telstra, but I could get a signal with Vodafone and it was quite a solid signal. So you just never quite know some things are going to be a little bit more different to others. But by and large, if you're traveling through regional Australia, Telstra is going to be your best friend because it's got the biggest coverage in all those places. The other thing you'll need is a good microphone. Don't rely on your laptop microphone because there's a very big difference in the quality. I'm going to turn off the crisp microphone and just go straight from my Rode USB mini microphone. So you're going to get a little bit of background noise once that does kick back in again. I think you can hear me again. Yeah, you can. So you're going to hear a bit of background noise. It's not going to be the best sound ever, but it's going to be pretty good and pretty clear. If I bring it right up to me, I can even do voiceover. So I can do like a radio announcer and have a very clear coming through that microphone. Put it back down, still pretty clear, pretty, still pretty good. Now let's switch this over to now when I'm putting this together through just the microphone on my computer. Now let's bear in mind that computers, are, um, Mac, Macintosh computers are very, very good microphones on them, right? The problem is though, that it sounds hollow, echoey, and it's picking up everything around. It's not really isolating just my voice. Even though it's got a great microphone, it's not the best one. So I switch back now to my crisp microphone plugin, which is going through my little uh, Rode USB. So you should have lost a few words there, but you're back again. Much more clear, much easier to understand, and it makes a big difference. Now, one of the other side things I do as well as all this is I do voiceovers. So I've got a big voiceover job for New South, uh, sorry, Northern Territory Health Department to do some training materials voiced over for them. That's why I've got this little fella coming with me everywhere I go. Fits in my luggage really comfortably. It isn't too big. It's like the size of the palm of my hand. So it's, you know, not a huge tool at all. It's like quite a, quite a small one. So it doesn't take out a lot of room in my luggage, but it's got a really good quality condenser mic that helps me to do professional voiceover work as well. Even if you're not doing voiceovers, that microphone is going to make a world of difference because people will for, won't they will they will forgive poor visuals. They'll forgive you dropping out on Zoom calls, like your, your camera freezing and all that. What they won't forgive is having to sit through one hour of really really bad quality audio. On audio's front as well, there's lots of different tools you can use um, when it comes to your earphones. So a lot of people just use little iPhone plugs or the AirPods, very good quality. They're very good at what they do. But again, you know, may not be quite what you need to isolate yourself, particularly if you're in a noisy cafe somewhere or you're in a pub somewhere and you're trying to get a call done or you're trying to listen to some work that you need to do stuff on. So I would imagine getting over the head earphones are going to be a lot better for you. The other advantage of that is, and I'm just going to reach over and get them for myself. But I've got my, what I call newer, newer headphones. The subscription headphone that I use for like paying uh, about $12 a month, I think it is, 
and it sends constant software updates and it's very personalized to my listening habits and settings. So my Neura, I pull out and it's also, it acts as a, if you see that, they're just over the head headphones, which I need to put in front of me so you can see them. They've got really strong isolation because the plugs go in your, in your ear and then they also have the, the padded surrounding. Very comfortable for wear for long periods of time. Uh, if you wanna know who that brand is, it's Neura. So let's put that in front so you can actually see it. There you go, Neura. Um, and I subscribe to these so that I'm not paying literally hundreds of dollars. These things would be about a thousand bucks. Um, they're also noise canceling. So you're on a flight and you want to sort of have a good sleep. You don't want to hear that like constant hum of the engine. They're really good for that as well. Take phone calls. We've got a, a microphone. It works fairly well as well. That's really good for doing all that stuff with. So um, having a good set of headphones, you don't have to get these ones. They're possibly a little bit of overkill for most people. For me on the road and flying around a lot, they are the perfect match for me. And you know, you'll never talk me out of it and get me on a cheaper pair of headphones because they work an absolute charm for me. More things you would use in terms of um, the stuff that you would need to have as tools of the trade is your software. Zoom is gonna be your best friend. Um, I pay for Zoom because I do a lot of stuff on Zoom. Getting away with the free version of Zoom may work for you if Zoom is not at the core of what you do. But for me, it's a core system that I use as is Microsoft Teams through the Office 365 suite, as is Skype as well. So if you're not necessarily paying for Skype, but you're paying for Office 365 or Zoom, you're actually investing in what your product is. Google's Workspace product, which is um, that what used to be called G Suite, um, means you have professional email and you've got all those online tools that come with it. And most people don't even realize they're there. Things like Google Docs, Google Sheets, Google Slides are the equivalent of Microsoft Office in terms of the Sheets are spreadsheets, so it's Excel. The Docs are Word documents, just like Word. And the Slides are pretty much PowerPoint and they're online cloud hosted version of all those things. They're really, really good for that, as is Office 365. If you're, if you're a Microsoft person, you're using Windows, you're using Office 365, go for it, continue doing that because it's an excellent product. And you don't want to learn something new, do you? You want to stick around the things you know and trust and that work really well for you. So your software choices are going to be quite important for you, as are your creative choices. Now, I, as someone who does a lot of graphic work and a lot of um, layouts for clients who need them, and also video editing and audio editing, I use Adobe's Creative Cloud. So I'm paying about $67, $68 a month for that. What it gives me though, is all the tools I need to be able to create my podcast, create TV ads, create video for use on social media, including making the occasional TV ad for a client who needs that done. So that's a way for you to use software tools that are not necessarily encumbered on a single computer, but can be used as a cloud service and transfer from computer to computer when you need to do that. So having the right software tools means that you're less reliant necessarily on things that are in the cloud with patchy connections, and you can still do the work you need to do locally on the computer itself. But how do we find clients when we're out in the road living this digital nomad lifestyle? Well, we find clients through the ability to be able to, I guess, use our existing clients and migrate them from real world clients into virtual clients. We can search for more clients and sell ourselves to more people from our origin or the hometown or the place where we're actually from. And then there's a ways of making clients while you're out there on the road. Now, your existing clients are about converting those real world, real live relationship clients you have in your hometown to remote clients that you're going to service the same way you always did, but now it's going to be over mostly Zoom calls, phone, and email. So that's a very delicate operation can happen with some clients who are not very happy about being transferred to being a remote client because they're used to dealing with you in person. And they're one of those people that just likes to make a phone call, likes to be able to shake your hand, likes to be able to have a beer with you, whatever that is. So your existing clients aren't always going to be wanting to come across to this model with you. Unfortunately, if this is the model you're taking, you may sort of lose some of those clients. But I've never lost a client because I've gone remote. They've always stuck around with me because I do the same kind of work remote as what I would do if I was in town all the time. One way around this to keep those existing clients in those local areas 
is you can hand over certain tasks that need to be done locally. So that could be document collection, document signing. It could be taking photography, doing videography. If you've got partner businesses you deal with, partner contractors, or you've got friends who are still in that town, you could get them to do something like taking the photography and the videos at the particular premises, sending you those files over the internet, and then you do the editing and the work on them to make them look great for use in those social media campaigns and TV ads and whatever you're using that particular stuff for, you can make it look great because that's your skill set. You don't have to be on the ground to collect the footage because that's what you've got a team on the ground doing that for you. It means that the things that need to be done locally and in person are still done locally in person, keeps the client happy. They're still seeing someone from your business even if they're not necessarily seeing you. Now, the danger of that is, is that the local person could take that work away from you and say, well, look, rather than dealing with him over there in in Broome, let's just like dump him and let's now work with just the local guy. That is always going to be a risk. That's always going to be a problem. Um, That's something which you may have to overcome. You can also keep then the tasks that can be done remote. So if I'm handing off the photography and the footage and the signing to a local person, a cousin, a friend, a business partner, another contractor who I'm paying to do the work for me, it means then I can keep all the other stuff remote. So I can do all the admin, I can do all the production, I can do all the scheduling, I can do all the work within the platforms themselves in order to keep the work moving along. So just split it up. Send off the things back home to people who are back home to do the stuff that can only be done back home but do the stuff remote that can be done easily remote without being too much of a struggle. Gathering new clients from your origin, from your hometown, which means sometimes you have to visit home occasionally. You have to go home, go to the old hometown um, and, and, and visit occasionally. Now, in my case, I'm still there about 50% of the time. So it's not like as if I'm going to be missing in action all the time. I'm not going to be. I'm going to be working half the time from home, half the time from away. So I'm always going to be back visiting, seeing people, gathering up clients and selling some more marketing. But another way you can do it is you can advertise in your home market. If people know you, you've got a good uh, reputation, if they see your ad coming from Facebook or Google, they'll recognize you, they'll recognize your brand and understand that they can deal with you. Even if they don't know at this stage that you're actually working part of the time or all the time remotely and away from that particular market. What you can also do is incentivize your existing clients to send new referrals to you so that then they're getting a reason why they would refer someone new to you. So it could be 50 bucks off their next bill. It could be qualify for a free gift that I'm going to send you, or it could just simply be something as as simple as um, I will thank you very much if you refer a new client to me. It makes me more able to do what I do so I can keep that work going for you. But I think incentives need to be something very real, winning a prize, getting a cash bonus, a saving on the next quote, on the next job or on the next month's subscription. I think a really good way is to incentivize your existing clients who are happy with your work and especially happy with your remote work to refer you on to others who could take advantage of your skills without having to then do too much marketing advertising work within that particular market. But then there's always the way of getting clients when you're out there on the road itself. And this is a model I do a lot of. It's like when I go to Brisbane, I set up meetings when I'm here with meetings with potential new clients, with old clients that are no longer engaged with, or with clients that I've got right now. And I invite them to bring a friend along with them or another business along with them for me to have a chat with them as well. So I can give them my expertise and talk them through what I'm doing. So set up meetings wherever you are. If you're in Geraldton and WA, if you're in Catherine in the Northern Territory, if you're traveling through um, Southeast Queensland and you're from North Queensland, set up meetings there. I'm I'm meeting with people in in Cairns next week because it suits me to do that and it's an expansion market for me. So the ability to be able to do that means you're constantly growing your client based in new places and you're not so dependent upon that home market of where you came from, where you got all the reputation, all the assets and all the, the, the history. You're not so reliant on that. And the less reliant you are on that home market, the easier it is for you to work remotely from pretty much anywhere because these new people you're meeting on the road know you don't live there. You've told them straight off the bat, oh, I'm not from here. I'm actually from Darwin um, or I'm actually from Perth or I'm actually from Brisbane. I'm just passing through here, but I love working with people here because they come here so often. 
You can do free workshops. And this is another thing I do. I'm getting this going uh, on my next trip. So in about April, May, I'm going to be starting to do free workshops to introduce people to what it is I do uh, and give them some really good value to walk away with. So I'm going to teach them some stuff that they don't know now that they can walk away with and work really well with and apply their businesses straight away and get a good result. And then I'll have an incentive for them to take on more services from me, one-to-one coaching, ongoing help with their digital marketing or training them to do even more complex things when it comes to online marketing and traditional marketing as well. Doing those free workshops gets you in front of people. I've got a strategy right now where I'm producing a lot of ads that are going into the markets on Facebook that I'm trying to become more known in. So by those ads going into business owners, I'm making sure that they can see my face, know who I am. So when my ads come in, where I'm actually going to advertise that my workshop is going to be on at this particular place at this particular time, come along, it's free and enjoy a donut and a cup of tea. Well, then they'll know who I am, feel some degree of trust for me. And when I get in there, they're much more receptive to whatever my sales pitch may be at the beginning and middle, whenever I'm going to do it, or it may not be a sales pitch at all. I'll just wait for them to come to me like I do in most markets, give them some great value. Then they come back to me with what they need help with. Working at shared workspaces also gives you a very good opportunity to meet with people you normally wouldn't come across. You're not going to meet a lot of people in a cafe because people put on their headphones, they kind of do this, these ones, and then they hide behind their headphones and they make sure that nobody's really seeing much of them or interacting with them because their headphones on is a universal sign of go away, leave me alone, I'm busy working, right? But working in a shared workspace means that you are kind of in a place where there's a lot of other people who are doing what you're doing. They are also digital nomads. They're also people who are traveling and they're also possibly looking for new clients as well. You can refer some to them. They can refer some to you. You've made a new friend and you've got a whole new network starting to build in that particular city that you're operating in now. A little bit about the reality of life on the road though. And this really needs to be said because it's not all roses, um, pina coladas and walks in the rain on beaches of Bali. It certainly is not those things at all. In fact, it can be really hard work, poor sleep, and you know it can affect different things in your life. You've got to have the right sort of sense of time, the right command of your technology, and the right temperament to do this kind of thing. When I say time, you need to be very, very aware of time because when you're in other places, you're on different time zones you're on different cultural timings there's things like uh, in Bali got the Nepi festival which means the entire place goes silent and shuts down for days and you can't do any sort of work in fact if they see you doing work in a cafe you are uh, the cultural police come and wrap you over the knuckles pretty much you've got to hide in your hotel room if you can and just stay away and and work if you have to but you have to work away from people so timing is a very big thing. Now, that's, a, that's my struggle is time. It's a very hard for me to schedule everything the way I could. I've missed one thing today, two things now, sorry. I've missed getting back to a client about a particular proposal I need to do for them. And I've missed a phone call this morning. But my timing wasn't laid out right. I didn't set up my calendar correctly to account for the time it would take me to drive from one place to the other, the time it would take me to check out of the hotel, the time it would take me to move the car to the right place. And that has cost me about an hour of my day that I need to make up somewhere. So I'm going to hopefully make it up in the rest of the day, even though I've got a completely solid book day for the rest of the day as well. Your relationships are going to be a very deciding factor on whether you can be a digital nomad. While my friend Tim, who I work with through Treaty Business Consulting, has taken his family around Australia in a caravan with him and they're having an amazing time, homeschooling and all that sort of stuff. If you're in a relationship and you're the one who's a digital nomad and there's still someone at home who's looking after all the normal day-to-day stuff of like paying the bills, looking after the kids, that is going to have a big strain on your relationship. The digital nomad lifestyle particularly suits those people who are not in relationships at all, like myself. So I got this freedom to travel around a lot, or they're in a relationship which allows them the time away to be a good thing. So for instance, if you're dating, for instance, a medical student, and that medical student is spending a lot of time in regional areas away from you, even if you were living together, you'd be spending all that time away from each other anyway, because you're not going to move to Rockhampton for three months to do a rotation and then upend your life and then move to the next place. That's not how life works. So it does take a particular kind of 
relationships set up and it will have some effects on those relationships, not just people, romantic relationships and family relationships, but also friendships as well. If you're not around much, you're left out of things. And that leads to what the third one is, which is fear of missing out. You're going to miss out on a lot of stuff back home. You're going to miss out on being invited to birthdays. You're going to miss out on anniversaries, christenings, weddings, all those events that you normally would get to see within your friend and family circle. You're going to miss it because you're not around. The less you're around, the less you'll be invited. The less you're invited, the more disconnected you'll become. So that fear of missing out, that fear of losing relationships is very real. And you have to factor that into the decision you make when it comes to deciding to be a digital nomad or working remotely and doing your work from almost anywhere. The reality is also this, tired me yesterday in the Dome Cafe at Darwin Airport while I'm waiting for my Virgin flight to fill up and go and, and, and fly down to Brisbane, working on writing a, um, well, this one was like a, um, an episode of my podcast I was writing from my seat in my virgin flight so you know that's also the reality of what you're doing i'm wearing the same shirt today so that's another reality that i haven't had time to wash this shirt or get out other shirts because i've been rushing from one thing to the other doesn't stink so far so i think i'm okay i'm using a very good deodorant though so making sure you're, you're actually looking after things those logistic things like changing your shirt when you take a photo and say oh this was me yesterday and then showing up in a shirt the next day it's the same shirt. If you're not known as someone who has those, uh, has the one shirt at every location you do, then yeah, make sure you have a change of shirt at least to get into. It also allows me to go to shows like this one that was in Alice Springs, where I got to see a comedian that I hadn't been able to see in my hometown of Darwin. And I got to see her in Alice Springs at the Araluan Centre, which was amazing. It was a great night. Got to take along a friend in Alice Springs and we had a hoot. It was a really great night. It allows you to capture moments in places where you normally wouldn't be. It allows you to see, you know, you can't quite see it in this photo that clearly, but that morning, the Todd River in Alice Springs was flowing for the first time I'd ever seen. I'd never seen it flow before with water. And yet there it was. And I took a photo. There was a beautiful sunrise coming up over the mountains and there was water flowing in the Todd River. It was a moment that I wouldn't have had if I was stuck at home in my apartment in Darwin. And you also get to see the view from the air up there. It's uh, something very special about looking up over the clouds and reminding yourself that the world's a big place, but it's also a very, very small place. And that you've got to get a perspective on life that comes with travel. And as we're saying, if unless you're willing to immerse yourself into the travel, immerse yourself into the surroundings of where you're going to be and enjoy that life, then you're probably not going to have that greater life and you might as well just stay at home and work from the office. It also allowed me to meet my parents' new kitten. You know, she's absolutely adorable. She was um, an abandoned kitten that they've rescued and she's just gorgeous. And I've got to be there in the second week of her life in their house. And so I got to experience that because I wasn't stuck at home. I got to sit at Fitzroy Island with a bottle of water overlooking the amazing Great Barrier Reef Islands around Cairns. And then up in the Atherton Tablelands, you know, I got to share a moment with a scrub turkey and a photo I didn't manage to get was one of a cassowary passing by with his chicks um, because um, the male cassowaries look after the chicks when they're very young. And I got to experience that moment in that place outside the Atherton Tablelands because I was able to do that travel that other people weren't able to do. If I was stuck in the office back in Darwin, I wouldn't have had these particular experiences. So whilst, yes, it does have some impacts on your relationships and the FOMO is always there and always very real, you also get to have these experiences that make it so much more worthwhile. And that's at Ellis Beach, north of Cairns, a little bit earlier this year, and I was able to sit on a beach, build that website, which is for um, a, a client back in Darwin. And then that was my view. I was literally, what, 10 metres from the beach, waves rolling in, beautiful breeze, enjoying that lifestyle because that's where I chose to stay. It was really cheap to stay there. And I had a great internet connection I was able to use. So there's pros and cons. There's pros and pitfalls when it comes to remote working. So what will you choose? Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Dante St. James. You can contact me through this email address. I'd love to hear and connect from you on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, any of the platforms you're joining on. And please do remember that if you, uh, if you missed the end of this, you can watch it again on YouTube under the Business Station channel or just look for my name and you'll be able to find my version of it on there as well. 
But even more so than that, if you're watching on YouTube right now, please comment below if you liked what you did and smash the subscribe button so you're able to see more of this kind of content coming to you for free. Thanks to Business Station, the Australian Small Business Digital Advisory Services Digital Solutions Program, Regional Development Australia, Brisbane, and Treaty Business Consulting in the Northern Territory. Thank you very much for joining me. I hope you have a fantastic week. Let's go back to the reality. I'm not really on this tropical beach right now. I'm in that bedroom and um, it's not quite so glamorous. Let's uh, turn off that background. Yeah, that's where I really am. Have a great day. It's been really fun.